What's up, guys? This is Mega Talks. I'm Chris Thompson. Join me as I'll talk with interesting people of the world, from musicians to athletes to automotive enthusiasts, and much more. On this episode of Mega Talks, I'll talk with police officer Craig Hadaumi. He works out of Bellevue, Washington, and we'll talk about how he incorporates his skateboarding into his job, some of his experiences, his goals, and also his experience as a jiu-jitsu practitioner. So keep it locked. All right, I'm Christopher Thompson. I'm here on Mega Talks podcast, and I'm speaking with Craig Hanoumi, and I hope I pronounced that right. Yep, yep. So, Craig, why don't you tell us uh, where you're from and your job title, basically your description and kind of a little introduction so everybody kind of gets acquainted with who you are. Awesome, for sure. Well, my name is Craig Hanaumi, and I'm a police officer with the Bellevue Police Department here in Bellevue, Washington. I've been in law enforcement for 14 years, almost 14 years. I did my first three years with the Honolulu Police Department on Oahu, and I moved up to Bellevue in... 2006. And right now, my current position is the community station officer. I work out of one of the malls here in our city. And we supplement patrol. Uh, We still wear the patrol uniform, drive a black and white. And in addition to doing that, our position allows us the opportunity to make connections with the community through outreach and just uh, basically whatever way we we want. And uh, there's a lot of flexibility in that, and that's what led to some of the, the videos you may have seen or some of the pictures of us um, building relationships. Cool. And I, and I know a lot of the, you know, from when I first started following you, you know, online through your social media, I've seen a lot of the skateboard activities between you and some of the, you know, the local kids. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell us about that, kind of how that came about. And I know you enjoy skateboarding, so... Um, Tell us about some of your influences and, you know, your influence in the community with the children. Sure. So I'm kind of old. I'm a little older maybe than uh, some people might think. Uh, I'm 41, and maybe that's not that old yet. But in 85, (laughs) 85, uh, Back to the Future 1 came out, and I was about 10. And the next year after that, and of course, if you didn't see that movie, Michael J. Fox, there's like a huge skateboarding piece to that whole the the, Delor- the DeLorean and all that, but um, that movie plus there's this uh, bunch of videos, VHS, uh, Betamax that came out the next year or that year and the next year from Paul Peralta, which is a skateboard company, and they had this group of guys that they called the Bones Brigade, which to mainstream people maybe is unknown, but um, Tony Hawk was one of them, Steve Cavallaro, Mike McGill, Tommy Guerrero, Lance Mountain, nice, and they had some street skateboarders to Rodney Mullen and they they basically made like mixtapes and they sold them and that was basically bef- way before the internet and magazines there maybe there was just Thrasher and uh, Trans World but other than that you would have to watch video of people from uh, purchasing it so there's no other way to see skateboarding and those videos came out and uh, that kind of was right about the time when I think the Beastie Boys license to ill came out also. Uh, yeah. So all the combination of those things, yeah. It was like a I, I tell people it was like the perfect storm for skateboarding to explode into um popularity. So that's what started. And I, I didn't really have any kind of um connection to other team sports at that time. I I tried a lot of different things, but hmm. it was a it was an activity for me that was really enjoyable because it didn't rely on anybody else and it was um something that I could do by myself. Oh, yeah. And I understand that. Yeah, just a way to express myself and um, have an identity when I was growing up. So from fifth to maybe about end of eighth grade, pretty much skateboarded every day. And um, and that's something that a lot of people don't do. They don't know how to, you know, relate to themselves or keep themselves entertained with a certain activity. A lot of people, they need somebody else there, you know, just to, you know, to bypass that uh, downtown, I guess you'd say. And that's when they could start to slip into other activities, you know, thefts, uh, drugs, and, you know, 
whatever instead yeah, of something sure. constructive. Yeah, they um for me it was like I said I didn't I didn't really belong to any group of people and in school I was kind of floating around and I didn't really have any kind of connection to any one group and as for me skateboarding was perfect because it was something like I said I could do by myself and it was something that I didn't need to be um as a way to express myself and have an identity uh-huh. and when when you when when you're a kid it kind of especially that age range um just getting into middle school it's uh it's something that I think is important to have what what doesn't matter what activity but if you have a connection to something that is positive and not um you know oh, it's something that's sense. healthy yeah it's something that you can do to to uh <laughs> stay out of trouble and for us it was kind of hard because a lot of the places that we skateboarded were not for skateboarding because we didn't have to we didn't have any parks where there's a one park on oahu everything else was from uh skateboarding in like schools or drainage ditches oh, the, the empty the pools ditch. well uh, no like storm uh hum, hum, there's a uh, huge drainage ditches on the island uh, and some of them are kind of world famous oh yeah um, which were featured in some of those videos i talked about earlier uh-huh. there's one called, there's one called wallows which is in new valley and uh the bones brigade actually skateboarded there in the a video called it's like a cult classic called uh, search for animal chin and uh i when i saw that everybody on the island probably who was living there knew about it but after like the general population kind of heard about it, i think people actually went down to oahu to skate on that oh, yeah. in that place i mean it became kind of like a like the place to go because it was just i mean it was made for floods and you know making the water come through um yeah. the, uh, the area but it, perfect it was perfect skating. <laughs> now and, what's uh, interesting is you you kept the skateboarding going and you know i come around from the same era as you and you know i done i didn't do so much skateboarding as i done like bmx and i done like yeah. dirt jumps and stuff like that yeah, it was yeah. a was a big town thing that i like to do but you sure. you kept doing it and that's something that kind of fell off for me you know town has you know takes takes its toll on you so you start well, getting into other activities and you know going to school and it's interesting yeah. that you made it to the, be a police officer and you kept, cool. you know, with your skateboarding, which helps you out yeah. with your, you know, to make those contacts in the community. Well, that's that's funny because there was a, I tell people I took a break and then like, well, you know, because I, I didn't, I didn't skateboard consistently all the way through now. Oh, I yeah. took a short, mm-hmm. I took a short uh, 20, 25 year break. Wow. And, <laughs> that's a little short. <laughs> yeah. From, from uh, high school, basically all the way through basically a couple of years ago. Uh-huh. Um, it doesn't look like you got... took any breaks from the video. Oh, well, that's all with editing. <laughs> <laughs> the the beginning part, I mean, I started back up because um, there's a couple of reasons. There was, uh, there's, our city has, it's very supportive of um, the activity. So it supports the skate community because it has three outdoor parks. It has a humongous indoor park. Oh, that's and, cool. Uh, which, which is needed for western washington because it rains all the time but yeah. <laughs> um it's all it's all in our city and i forget one uh, one uh, november i think 2015 i went to one of the indoor parks to our indoor park to to kind of just watch because i've never actually been in there mm-hmm. i've seen video and, and pictures but uh, i just went in there i there's there's a bowls that we have in the community uh the, the city that we skated to but it, it was it was not as a regular thing until I went into the indoor park and one of the staff there, his name is Akash, hmm. and he, um, city employee that skate everybody who works at the park uh, skateboards and they're very 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 good, and he saw me and he kind of initially was had the like the look of like what happened you know what, what am I doing? <laughs> uh-huh. I was like, I'm, just here, I'm just here to watch and then he goes oh, okay that's just here to so break it watching. up. <laughs> yeah, he thought that something's wrong you know, uh, which is not not surprising but. Um, he, at the end, he's like, hey, you want to skate? And I was like, sure. So he kind of went at it as if I didn't know. And I didn't try to, um, I didn't really acknowledge that I knew a little bit mm-hmm. or I knew how. And then he saw me skate a little bit. He's like, oh, okay, you, you know what you're doing. So <laughs> his, his, he had a, a comment on his Instagram and he, he tagged me in a picture that was so positive like about the interaction and mm-hmm. that experience because I'm assuming that was like the first time he ever had a contact with an officer who was skateboarding, and of, and I know that it's a really positive uh, contact. And he he commented about it. It's like, shoot, you know what? That that I can 
I can do that activity and use it as a way to connect with people that I wouldn't have otherwise come in contact with. And that's kind of how it started. Yeah. Cause a lot of people, you know, they, they see you as um, just that police officer. They don't identify, you know, directly with the police officer as, you know, outside of that, you know, job, pretty much think you like RoboCop, you know, you go yeah. home and you think about law enforcement all the time. Don't realize that you have, you know, that talent for skateboarding and just, you know, the skateboard lifestyle, you know, so to speak. Um, oh, sure. I know I saw on your Instagram that um, you got uh, some donations from some skateboarding or some equipment or things like that. Uh, do you want to yeah. discuss that? Yeah, sure. The The Instagram account actually just uh, it's just my name, Craig Hanaumi. And um, I started doing that because there wasn't any place or uh, location that we could show some of the outreach that we do. And one of the most common feedback, uh, common comments we got, or I got whenever people asked us, what are we doing for the community was when I showed them what we're doing before I had the Instagram, the, the most common response was, well, we want to see, it would be great to see more of that. And there wasn't any location that I had any, I would have to email pictures of stuff or just talk about it, but there wasn't any oh, uh, no location as they, they can follow. And Instagram was perfect for that because it's visual and the format of pictures and video is, is, is exactly what, um, it was great. So I used that to start off with that, uh, to just showcase, to have a central location for people to go like, Oh, this is the things we're doing instead of just listing everything, you know? Okay. And, um, from that, uh, Bobby, Bobby White, officer, Bobby White from Gainesville, uh, PD in Florida saw that he had, um, he has his own nonprofit that he started from a viral video that was started off of his dash cam of a patrol car when he started playing basketball with some kids oh, in, uh, and then that was the one where, I don't know if you've seen it, but, uh, Shaquille O'Neal got involved with it the next time when they came back and yeah, I saw it, that one. It, yeah. So he ended up seeing my uh, video somehow. And then he messaged me and said that, Hey, he has a nonprofit and through his nonprofit, of course, they, they connect and, make donations for basketball related stuff. But he saw my stuff and he said, yeah, we, we can send you guys some skateboards and some helmets and oh, some other gear. And I was like, yeah, let me run it by my chain of command. And uh -huh. they were all full. So he sent, he sent five uh, complete skateboards, five helmets, and then a uh, set, five sets of elbow, knee and wrist guards, uh, oh, elbow, yeah, knee that, pads. That stuff's important. And yeah. Think... And then we go ahead. But yeah. no, we just got, we got it. And we just, uh, I, I donated it to, uh, uh, a couple uh, kids in our community who didn't have um, those things, and that was it. Was a great, uh, yeah, it was super awesome. Nice, because uh, you know, coming from our days, you know, you went to um, you know whatever store and you looked for a skateboard. They could have been fifteen or twenty dollars and not made out of wood, and you know you right. got what you got. But like today, your average skateboard can be anywhere from eighty-five dollars up to you know however much you want to spend or however much you want to put on that. So not everybody has that luxury of just going to the store and picking up, you know, uh, you know, a cheaper value skateboard. Sometimes if you do, they're all, the decks are all bent up and they're hard to skate on. So it's important, sure. you know, to have, you know, decent equipment so you don't get hurt and you can learn the correct way to ride. No, for sure. And um, that was really neat that he, he connected with me through that. And I mean, we're super grateful that that happened. I mean, that, you should, the kids, the kids who got the boards and the equipment and then the parents, I mean, I think some of them saw his video already, so they kind of knew what, who he was, but um, it was just a really awesome, awesome day that when I got to deliver it all, there's okay. a little post of that, that we made that, that got shared too, but it was just a really, it was a great way for us to connect, you know, opposite coasts in the United States, but um, same mission. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the kids were grateful and everybody's grateful for that. Yeah, yeah, no, they had a blast. We all had a blast. Mm -hmm. So, so going back and I'll go ahead and ask the question. I'm sure everybody wants to know. Uh, before becoming a police officer, um, why did you want to become a police officer? What was your main goal or focus? All right. I wish I had a. I always tell people who ask me that, like, if I had a great story, I would just start sharing <laughs> it. But I don't really have any kind of profound, you know, reason. I'll just say, and I, I joke to everybody that the the reason why I did this job, the the uh, fake reason is that it's the closest job to being Batman. Oh yeah. But, 
I like that answer. But that's the short, cool reason. But the real, I mean, there was no, I uh, graduated from University of Hawaii with my BA in psychology and I didn't really want to go to school some more. Um, you can't really do anything with a, a Bachelor of Arts in psychology or sociology by itself. I mean, not in, in the field that you you majored in anyways. You need like a master's. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, it's just too expensive. And I didn't really like school that much enough to keep going. And like I said, the cost was a primary reason, but yeah, yeah, I just had a couple classmates. I, I ended up working in a three years in school setting and a, and a group home setting with um, adolescents who had different degrees of the autism, autism spectrum disorder. And mm-hmm. that was really, that was really good. That ended up in hindsight being really, really good uh, prep for for doing this and um that's i did that for uh, three years and i think one of my my first cousin uh who lives in orange county this visit he used to fly down every summer to to stay with my one of my uncles on oahu and i heard he was applying for the honolulu police department and it's like uh, i had a couple high school classmates who were in the department and mm-hmm. kind of at that point in my life where i i was doing the other I was working in the school, in the home, group home, and I didn't really have any kind of, my parents, they're very old school, traditional. I was, you know, they, they, they thought I was doing a good thing with my, my work and stuff, but they were, they kept asking, well, when are you going to get a real job? And I was like, <laughs> when are you going to get like a real, like, uh-huh. I had, I had, uh, there's so many uh, highly educated people on my mom's side. Like my sister, my sister's a pediatrician. And I mean, and so it was kind of hard. I, f- I felt like I was the black sheep, even though I had my, my, my BA in psychology was like the least amount of education on my mom's side of the family. Oh, yeah. Well, being, and, um, you know, police officers, it's an education, but it's a very different type of education from, you know, separate from, you know, some of the other fields that you have because yeah. a lot of it's, a lot of it's on the job and it's unexpected. There's not a lot of yeah. textbooks that can show you what's going to happen and can give you an outline, but nothing's ever predictable. Right. So, yeah, I mean, so basically I, I kind of, I applied to the Honolulu Police Department because I had some high school classmates who were in it. And, you know, at that time when I kind of did the math, it was the highest, it was the, the degree you could relate to our work. Um, psychology or sociology would be a related degree. Mm-hmm. So it was the highest paying job that I could see myself doing at that point with that amount of education. So I just applied and I ended up enjoying it. And here I am. So you started in Honolulu. Yes. And what made the transition from there to uh, Bellevue or Bellevue? Yeah, Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like a lot of people in the islands, I my ex at the time uh, wanted to move to the mainland. Uh, she's from the mainland, and a lot of people who grow up in Hawaii leave for school. They go to school in the West Coast or somewhere else, okay. and then they end up staying, staying and working. And I mean, the price, yeah, you know, what do you call it? They call it the price of paradise. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's, okay. it's so high. It prices people out, and oh. the cost of living plus the the pay, which is lower for pretty much every job, um, those two things combined, you have to either settle for much, much less, or or leave. And oh. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people, not just. I mean, law enforcement and just any regular civilian as well, is, they get priced out. And mm-hmm. I mean, that was, I, in hindsight, I, mean, I would have to definitely say that that was one of the reasons, too. I mean, um, so, yeah, just I always wondered what what policing would be like on the mainland. I mean, and, you know, I mean, it's just the patrol aspect is almost I would say it's very similar. Oh, okay. And that's, I mean, I only worked in two different states, but mm-hmm. the transition the transition for me was pretty pretty good from patrol to patrol it wasn't uh yeah the 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 act the the role of us as police uh in the patrol capacity is was similar at least from my experience between those two uh places even though it might not seem like it's it's a lot it's very similar Uh and um you know there's there's critics and people out there that you know criticize the job and try and tell um you how to do your job or what you should be doing what do you say to people that uh, that make the comment that you know skateboarding with kids and you know giving them things and just spending your time t- 
talking to people, you know, that's not, you should be out catching criminals, you know, you should be right. sitting on property <laughs> catching that criminal yeah. or the drug dealer on the corner. What do you yeah. say to those people? How, you know, this is my tax dollars at work, you know, of course. my tax dollars going to this. What do you say to those people? Yeah, I mean, the funny part is people from the Instagram, because I don't post the whole day, you know, I think there's enough video and pictures of officers doing regular police work already. So I typically post all of the outreach, the, mm -hmm. the, the times we times we serve dinner, the times we um, teach self-defense, the times we connect with skateboarding or whatever else sport, like badges for baseball. Um, and with all the different organizations in our city, I post all of that stuff because partly because I was kind of tired of seeing just the same negative stuff only getting highlighted every time. And oh, yeah. I uh, was like, well, I'll, I'll make, I'll make my own feed of good stuff mm -hmm. because people would always ask me like, well, what things are we doing? And I was like, well, we are, we're doing actually a lot. And once I started posting and now the opposite effect is happening, people are like, well, do you do anything else besides skateboarding? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny how that, that turned around, but yeah, I mean, I there's, like there's, the, the majority of the comments are positive and the ones who, will say so I mean the irony is like I think even some skateboarders were like looking at that and this the very 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 tiny minority said something like well shouldn't you be like arresting somebody <laughs> and, um, yeah that's, that's, that's funny coming from people who you know who skateboarded or uh or who enjoy like that activity is, is weird but mm -hmm. I mean the main the main there's so many benefits but I think the one that people are kind of forgetting when they see outreach is that it's a um it's a form of crime prevention and I say sure. that because it doesn't, I mean, the initial contact and interaction doesn't have any kind of tangible way to quantify it. So mm -hmm. you can put it, you can put, it's hard to, it's hard to gauge, well, how much people are not getting into trouble or not getting arrested because of a police contact or, or how many people have a positive impression on, on, in, uh, connected to law enforcement now because of those contacts. And, and while initially it might not seem like, well, what does it have to do with uh, mm -hmm. crime prevention. I mean, anytime we establish good rapport with anybody in the community, um, when they wouldn't have had it otherwise, and not, not necessarily would be bad, but they just wouldn't have any kind of contact. So it wouldn't be positive or negative. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes people more comfortable to come up to us. And I've already seen it so many times to know that it's true that if there's a contact that we have, that's positive, And if something happens to that person or a person who they know in their community, they're going to feel comfortable telling me about it. And, when they do, I mean, that's some of those cases that we solve would not have been solved if it weren't for those kinds of contacts. Like if people weren't comfortable enough to come up to us and share information with us, like, hey, I saw this guy uh, over here with the shotgun hmm. or the, the guy, the guy was uh, holding the knife, um, you know, he's wearing this, this color clothing. And we can go back and kind of cross check that with video or other evidence. And that has solved cases for us. Oh, and um, that and that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the initial contact. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, I've seen it so many times and that that's just one of the, re that's not even, I mean, I don't know if there is a main reason, but I mean, that's, that's just one. Another one is like use of force. We have mm -hmm. good connections with people in the community, a good rapport. It, it, it deescalates situations automatically because if you have a positive contact with a person when stuff is going fine, and when stuff is going wrong, it's it's so much easier to just to make the connection because you're not meeting them for the first time during that moment. So you don't have to you don't have to build rapport because you already have it. And yeah. if you already then you can de-escalate situations before they they get worse. And it doesn't always happen, of course, but I mean it's yeah. priceless. Yeah, and they identify you as more of a an acquaintance or a friend rather than just, yes. you know, an opposition and stand yes, it's off. Huge, huge and and like I said, that kind of that kind of situation is not quantifiable. I mean, because you don't know whether that's going to happen or not. And I mean, I, I just look at it and our department would, our, our, our chief would feel the same way. It's like an investment. Definitely. And uh, you don't know, you don't know how it's going to pay out, but it's, when it does, it's huge. It's humongous. Yeah. And um, it's worth it. One incident less of, of force, if there was an option to avoid it or, mm -hmm one case that could be solved uh, due to the kind of contact in the report. I mean, it's worth it, but I think it's just hard to quantify in the beginning because you don't know if that's going to be there. And that's not even the reason, you know, that's not like the main reason why 
the outreach is done. The outreach is done to connect and build relationships. Mm-hmm. And whatever positive uh, effects that come out of that is just a bonus. But uh, those are two of them. And, um, you know, it's kind of, I think it's kind of hard for people to see that sometimes because all they see is like, a person who's looks like they're not doing any kind of real police work. But I mean, oh, I mean, yeah, it, that's, that's the real police work, uh, community outreach, uh, just those making connections with the people, positive experiences. Yeah. Um, like when you come to work, um, is there a goal for the day? Do you have something rather than just, you know, your regular schedule or agenda, is mm-hmm. there a specific goal or a, like a theme that you keep from one shift to the other, you know, something that drives you every day? Well, like I said, yeah, my position, I have the luxury of time to invest more than patrol does because I don't have to be available for calls so I can invest time in meetings and presentations and meeting with different organizations or property managers of different apartment complexes. And this position allows that versus in patrol where you can't just say, I'm going to be in meetings for the next two hours. I mean, you can't, you can't do that um, because everybody else will have to cover the area that you're working because you're not going to be available. So uh, because of those, because of that uh, luxury, I get, I get to make connections. So I guess the main Besides the others, the routine stuff that I do that's, that supplements patrol, I mean, our, our chief, if you were listening or you were able to speak on this, he would say that, you know, one of the things I can do is he has this phrase called the trust bank account. And okay. anytime we have an interaction with the community that's, um, that's positive, it's like a deposit into that bank account. Mm-hmm. And but my general, to me, my mission, my typical mission in the day, in a, tip, in a typical shift is just make deposits. Oh yeah. How many deposits are you going to make in a day? Make as many as I can. And, um, I that, mean, that's, it's, that it's so simple. People. It changes their life. Yeah. I mean, it's such a small, it's a small, I mean, it doesn't have to be a profound thing like getting, uh, skateboards. I mean, just making connections and it doesn't even have to be through an activity, but, um, it's just so much easier when it's something that isn't, a, isn't a sit down, sit in a circle, talk to each other kind of thing, because that seems to me that has always been kind of like a, I mean, I, I hated doing that when I was a kid. I didn't like to sit down and talk talk in a group of pe- with a group of people yeah. about what, what's going on. It's just, it just seemed too forced and not uh, not authentic. Uh-huh. Versus doing an activity, yeah, you know, yeah. which is activities like kind of break the barriers down and you know lets your personality through. Yeah, and you don't have to say one word even. I mean, you could just like be there and do the activity, which is why it's so much easier. Like whatever the sport or act- basketball, skateboarding, softball, running around. You know, whatever. It's just, it's just so much easier to connect like that. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, I mean, if, if there's time, you can, I mean, people do it in patrol over here too, but um, because I'm lucky that I have extra time to to invest in it more. So, yeah, just making deposits every single day. Yeah. Is it just a solo mission? Is it just you in that position or do you share that with another officer? Well, we have uh, two uh, substations in our city uh, at two different malls. And, um, I think the beauty of that position for us anyway, as far as I, what I saw is that the person who's in charge of those uh, stations or in, in those areas in that position can do not whatever they want, but there's a flexibility in, in, in going about the job in whatever way that is kind of tailored to their personality. So like the person before me, they weren't skateboarding or you know teaching self-defense because that wasn't their niche, mm-hmm. but they were doing some, our um, position, we do things like National Drug Take Back Day, which is when people bring in all the prescription meds that they don't want to have in their house. Yeah. We coordinate um, National Night Out, which is in uh, the first Tuesday of uh, uh, first Tuesday of August every year. And um, National, there's a child safety fair that's coming up next month in May that we fit kids with bicycle helmets and just have a, a lot of different cool. uh, first responders meet up in one of the malls to hmm. just to be there and just have uh, like make connections. So, um, I mean, it's a mission that our chief wants all of us to do. I mean, that, that aspect of it, he, he is huge on it. And, yeah, um, deposits. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he'll mention it every single time. I mean, I, every show that he'll speak on, or uh, you get the opportunity to speak about it. He'll, he'll probably bring that up. And, um, I mean, I love it. I mean, it's, it's it's how I would probably do it anyways. I just never heard it phrased like that, but I love that analogy. Nice. And um, you mentioned some other activities besides, you know, just the skateboarding thing. I see that you're a musician. You're a trombone player. 
And I take that as, you know, if you can play the trombone, you can probably play other brass instruments, tr uh, trumpets, um, baritones, tubas. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm a musician, but uh, <laughs> I played I played from middle school through college. And um, I mean, the brass, the mouthpiece is, I don't know if you ever played uh, this. It's not automatically transferable, probably like euphonium and trombone is because is, this is, mouthpiece is the same size, but. Uh, trumpet for me was just too hard. It's too tiny. Oh, yeah. See, I, I played trumpet. I played trumpet in high school and <laughs> junior high and all through there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, I mean, like I said, that I joke with people, the outreach that I do is all just my hobbies in disguise to pretend it's outreach. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's just, that's the big, beauty of it. Because there, there's right, somebody yeah. out there that's watching and thinking, you know, I want to do that. You know, this guy's a police yeah. officer. I think I can, you know, I don't want to be the police, but hey, I may want to play the trombone or maybe I want to skate. And they yeah. see you doing it, so you have a big, you know, you inspire people. Maybe maybe they're not typically inspired if they're just sitting around watching YouTube or TV. Yes. You know, they just see the typical person, you know, skating or doing whatever the activity. But when they see a police officer doing it, they're like, hey, that's that's a challenge. Maybe I can, you know, step my game up. Sure. It's, it's, it's weird because... The only reason why it has attention is because I wear the uniform. Yeah. Because exactly. I'm not, not, I'm not really good at either one of them. Like I'm okay at trombone, but skateboarding for sure. I'm probably like, uh, I mean, I'm good for a 41 year old police officer, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> there's eight, there's eight year old, seven, eight year old kids who are way better than me. Uh -huh. But uh, I mean, the reason why I think it connects is, besides it's a little, it's novel. Is that it's, it's not even about the activity, like the instrument, like playing music or skateboarding or whatever it is. It's it's about making connections with uh, people, and I think the thing that transcends any of the activities is the the aspect of caring for the community, mm -hmm. and that kind of comes that kind of that comes through hopefully more than the activity. It's not even about what it is. It's about that the idea of um, caring for the community, and anybody can do that. You don't have to be a police officer. You don't have to be. I mean, you can just be a, a regular citizen and, mm -hmm. and you, whatever skill, yeah, whatever skills that you have, you can make a difference. And, mm -hmm. um, you yeah, know, that's, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. I like that. Um, you talked about, um, self-defense aspect and I know from watching around and I also train that you, um, you're experienced in the art of jujitsu and you also, <laughs> From what I get, you teach self-defense and, you know, train some of the public people in self-defense and also compete a little bit. So, you yeah. know, tell us a little bit about your, um, you know, your jiu-jitsu. Sure. Well, I'm a, I've been doing jiu-jitsu for almost nine years. I'm a purple belt under Hedon and Henry Gracie, the Gracie Academy in Torrance, California. And I actually started training through work. So it's oh. kind of... It's kind of opposite from, I guess, what some people may think. But through work, I started just, I needed to find, I, I always enjoyed fitness. That was one of the things I, I, I've, I've enjoyed for a long time. But to me, fitness didn't automatically translate to being able to protect yourself. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a big guy. And I personally experienced that. Being, I was like, oh, I'm super fit. I can, you know, do whatever, 200 push-ups, And I can run, you know, a mile in whatever time. But I couldn't. Like how how would I protect myself against a bigger, stronger person? And mm -hmm. when there's a, when the, when there's a disparity like that, it's it's not enough to be super strong or super fit. I mean, that helps, of course, better than not. But um, the to overcome or neutralize a humongous size difference, like 50, 100 pounds, you need to know te uh, techniques. Yeah, and sure. uh, and jujitsu, that's what jujitsu jujitsu was for me. It was like a way for me to neutralize uh, size and strength as much as it realistically can be. And um, I started with a, a law enforcement course called the Gracie Survival Tactics for military and law enforcement personnel, which is what the which was, uh, Henner and Hedon teach um, across the, the country. Mm -hmm. And I went to the winter classes in 2008, and that's what kind of hooked me. And just ever since then, I've been uh, training. We fly back annually, and um, they come up here. Uh, every year as well to teach um, the same course to nice. to uh, to law enforcement locally and and people come from out of the state and out of the country too. But I mean, it's it's a simple, it's one of the it's a hobby that has direct application to what we do. I mean, yeah, I enjoy sure. jujitsu as a as an activity, but it also has a self defense component and the application and it um, and again, I mean, it's, it's something I enjoy that can be outreach. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 multiple things and it has multiple benefits and. 
I mean, like I said, I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I can do that. I can, we can teach, we teach a self-defense class every week to uh, the community, to like, middle school and older at the, uh, one of our community centers here. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's just so easy. Like I said, it's an activity that is, is applicable and relevant to a person, you know, and not that there's nothing wrong with any other physical activity like a sport, but you know, I don't I don't know how basketball is going to protect me in a fight, you know, or. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's other... a level of self-protection, you know, some some level of self-defense where they can be, you know, because you got to be physically, you know, some some type of fitness to be able to defend yourself. Sure. Whether it's just running or just, you know, um, sometimes observ- observing or standing on the or talking on the phone to report something takes a right. level of skills. Because um, when your adrenaline gets going, sometimes you find yourself, people can't actually describe what's going on. They can't tell sure. people where they're at, locations. Uh, they're not able to breathe because they're almost into a state of panic. Yeah. So you have to that's what, that's some what... type of focus. Yeah, I mean, jiu-jitsu brings that because even though the sport of, like the sportive aspect of jiu-jitsu to me, the one downside is that there is no uh, incorporation of uh, distance management. So you don't have to have any kind of idea about like, oh, I can get punched from over here, Mm -hmm. which what we do is, I mean, that's almost like the most important thing. So that aspect sometimes is kind of lost in the the grapple because in the grapple, you don't have to worry about that ever. And um, so you can go into like an infinite number of positions and and kinds of... um, incorporate all different all different kinds of moves and grips but i think the one i think reality check is if the other person can hit you you're not going to be doing all of a lot of the site a lot and all you don't have to do you don't have to do one or the other i mean you can still obviously do both but i think from our especially from the law enforcement application it has to one be transferable to a person who is not no jujitsu like zero jujitsu just Mm -hmm. you know 50 100 pounds heavier and wants to hit you like how are you going to deal with that and uh, and then, you know, the rest of the aspect could come in. The, the one thing that does transfer a lot is, like you said, the uh, ability to um, kind of desensitize your body or acclimate your body to being in a a confrontation with somebody who is resisting. Yeah. Uh, or trying really to do different. techniques on you. Right? And, that's, and that aspect of it is very transferable to self-defense mm-hmm. because, you know, essentially it's like, in some ways, it's like a fight without punches. Yeah. And, uh if you can, if you can learn how to modulate your, your uh, adrenaline and things like that, I mean, it, it's not easy. But after a while, it starts to become almost like routine. Like, okay, I know what this person could do. This could be these three options, mm-hmm. and the counters for all those three options, and it just makes you more uh, calm. And mm-hmm. that obviously works in the moment, and it also works before right, with officer presence and just the idea of being able to stay calm when something could be chaotic and that by itself de-escalates situations too when a, a person doesn't have to be as um, on edge, I guess, mm. because you, there's obviously unknowns and there's not going to apply for every situation because people have weapons and things like that. But yeah, I yeah, tell a lot of my people that, um, you know, you can, you can know a lot and you can go to class and do a lot, but the, if you've never been hit or struck or, you know, just bruised up inside a fight, so you're not going to know how to react. You can know all the skills in the world, but until you get hit, things are going to change. Your yeah. mind's going to tell you how to get out rather than the fight if you let yeah. that take over, if you never had that experience. So you got to train yeah. your mind just as well. Yeah, and it's, just, it's, a, it's like a pressure test, pressure tester for for whether you can transfer the skill set to a real-life application. And, you know, It's not necessarily the same as a fight because, like I said, there's no punches, but, I mean, people who think that they can just think their way through a situation. I mean, that's a mistake. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's very unlikely that that's going to work out well when there's no practice, there's no prep. I mean, yeah. and that's unless why I love you. That's a really good talker. <laughs> True. Right. And that, yeah, that, that, that works too, but uh, not all the time. <laughs> now something, something else that um, I read about, well, let's say this. Um, that I'm bringing up the competition now. By the time this podcast um, mm-hmm. is released or you know available, you'd already mm-hmm. competed. But do you have a competition coming up next week? And it says something about Rumble for John. And yeah. I want you to explain the kind of like what's the Rumble for John and what kind of competition and what's going on with that. Well, John, uh, the Rumble for John was a hashtag we came up with to fundraise in memory of our coworker and friend uh, John Nurse. And he was a corporal in our department who 
uh, lost his life to brain cancer last December. And he actually had brain, he, gosh, he was, he was in remission for about 10 years, I think. And um, it came back. And um, so in memory of him and his, uh, to raise some money for his family, we're doing a um, event this Saturday. It's going to be April 29th at a, a gym over here called Ring Sports United, where we'll have uh, 13, 13 of us, of uh, myself and my coworkers, are going to be doing some um, some fights. Uh, there's going to be six boxing matches between 12 of my coworkers, and I'm going to be doing a, uh, a jiu-jitsu match with John's oldest son, Quincy. And he's a he's eighth grader. It's funny because it's funny we're almost like the same size, you know, because I'm, like I'm not a big guy. But uh, he's been training for about little, uh, maybe two and a half years, and uh, he's very good. You know, so that that is just more to me that that uh, was just a, a neat way for um, him to be involved with the, the event. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I trained with him before. He's super fun, very, very smart, very intelligent and um, really articulate for somebody his age. Um, he's like older than his years. And, um, you know, he had to go through the tragedy of losing his dad. And mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, we just it's just a, a neat way to support his family and him, which Hopefully, the mo all the money will go to um, a fund for him and his two sisters for uh, college when they get old enough to go to college. And oh, it's just like a fun way for us to raise money for that. And as well as have some camaraderie in the department, mm -hmm. get everybody together. Uh, Andy Smith, who is on our uh, SWAT team and works in our um, vice narcotics uh, unit, is he, kind of his idea, kind of sort of like the off of um, inspired by the guns and hoses kind of events where they have oh, firefighters. Yeah. And it could eventually morph into that. But initially, he just wanted to keep it uh, within our department. And uh, each each time we do an event, it will be for a specific cause and just happens this time. The first yeah. one is going to be in memory of John. And so that's what's happening this Saturday. So that's good. yeah, my match, my match with Quincy is going to be a, a, it's going to be a blast because we have um, we got some police patches actually uh, got patches from John's uniform, his corporal stripes that we uh, are going to have patched on to Quincy's uh, sleeves. Oh, so he's going to have nice. there. And uh, yeah, it's going to be super fun. Uh, we'll probably post some pictures and video of the event. Um, he's going to have his, his, his jujitsu. One of his jujitsu teachers is, is going to coach corner him. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, it's, it's going to be in a ring and it's just going to be super, super cool for, uh, for a really good cause. Nice. And there a lot of people that benefit off that, not just the family, um, it's important for the community as well and you know it'll promote fitness within the department you know when everybody comes out and competes and, and also you get that camaraderie with people that you may not necessarily work a shift with but you'll get to know them in, oh yeah in a personal capacity not just you know on the job or in the locker room or passing yeah no i yeah it's, a, it's an amazing thing our department is not huge you know we have under 200 uh sworn uh personnel and um because of that, I think I like it better because I actually know everybody by name, and um, it's a little bit different from uh, from my former. Like Honolulu had like two thousand officers, so it's wow. way too big. But but for here, yeah, we get all, all the people who are like you said, they're training for the event and they're getting uh, super hyped too, and they're doing extra workouts and you know because nobody nobody wants to look bad in front of their friends or family. But um, oh no, at, at, at the end of the at the end of the day, we all know it's it's. It's for John, you know, it's for his family uh -huh. and the side benefit of us coming together as a department for, um, for him is just a bonus and, um, nice. uh, it's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, probably going to let you get back to, um, your job cause we've been talking for a while. I don't want to keep you away for too long, but, uh, right. go ahead and tell everybody, uh, maybe how they can contact you if they're local, but, uh, contact uh, or your contacts through social media. Um, how can everybody, you know, kind of follow along with what you're doing? Okay, yeah. There's uh, well, I have an Instagram page, which is just my name, Craig Hanagumi, C R A I G H A N A U M I, and um, that's where I post a lot of the outreach. Most of it. Um, our police department has a Facebook page, Bellevue Police Department, Washington, and have a Twitter as well. Um, some sometimes some of the outreach goes goes on to there too, but um, yeah, those are the two main ones. I I, I don't really do anything else. Um, I don't have my own, I don't have my own page of Facebook or my I have my own personal page, but I don't have like a general public one because 
Mm-hmm. I, don't, I just don't have enough time to do all this stuff. Oh, it I just, takes some time. Yeah, it, it takes too much. I mean, all, all the stuff is, it seems like it's, I just, I don't want it to become like overwhelming. I just post it because of the stuff we do in the community that people want to see. And um, mm-hmm. one, one social media thing for that is enough. And, uh, so yeah, people want to follow me and check it out. Um, I, I just like to do it because uh, many times the good stuff that we do, like, you know, it doesn't ever get any kind of hype or publicity. And that's unfortunate because you know, not to say that any officer who does those kinds of things cares because most of us would want, would not want that. Like, like the opposite of wanting any kind of attention. Mm-hmm. But the only reason why I started doing it was because I kind of got tired of seeing only negative stuff. Yeah, and I, I definitely want to see more positive things going on out there. Uh, yeah. It's just, more it's positive just things happening. You know, we don't want to have to show something that's always just negative. And it, even though if it's not shown, you still don't like the negative happening because there's, I mean, everything that you say, share on social media, you can probably multiply that times 100 with the good things and the bad things. So I definitely want to see more positive. Yeah. Not, not just on, you know, law enforcement side, but uh, community side from citizens too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just, man, it, sometimes you, it makes people not want to log into something, right? Because everything in, on it is like, negative <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of, it gets, it's kind of old to me i mean it's like yeah if we want to be down you know just just scroll through a feed of something it's like everything is like bad stuff bad stuff so because it's kind of sure you like i was when you go to the academy you know you see all the depressing things and you know horror stories and now you you open up your facebook or your feed and you see the same stuff and you're like man sure. you know that's don't need to be experiencing that we don't cut those experiences yeah. out yeah, there's there's enough there's enough negative there's more than enough negativity outside so I mean I don't know mm-hmm. nice to see some some positive good stuff once in a while oh yeah so definitely keep what keep on doing what you're doing um, I enjoy observing from where I'm at and everybody else out there give him a follow um, look him up on the Instagram and follow comment um, just become a part of it and you know if that influences you and you get your calling in some way that you need to influence somebody or inspire somebody, um, go ahead and do that. Cause, um, yeah, you gotta get out and be a part of the world, not just an observer and yeah. influence and change some lives. Yeah. I just want to thank you for having me on Chris and, um, yeah, anybody can make a difference. You don't have to be doing law enforcement. You don't have to be a, a position of authority or, or, or anything. I mean, sure. any, any person can do something to make your community better. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate you giving me the time. For sure, man. Uh, yeah, come out. Keep in touch, and I'll keep in touch as well. And maybe we'll do it again sometime, or, or just you know, you never know. We may rub, uh, um, run across each other at an event or um, something. Hopefully, yeah. If you come out, if you come out to our side of the the country, you got to bring your key, and uh, we can do uh, have a role. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you take care. And um, always, you know, watch your six and take care of everybody else. Make it home. Likewise. All right. Just want to thank Craig Hanaumi once again for coming on the podcast and talking with us. Remember, you can follow his social media, on one on Instagram and also on Twitter. First name Craig, C-R-A-I-G. Last name Hanaumi, H-A-N-A-U-M-I. And also the um, event that we were talking about, you still have time to donate. If you go to his Instagram, there should be a link up there. So after the show airs, you can still make donations. And if you haven't, remember to go listen to episode one where I speak with Eric Heath from Jits Crips. Eric gives us a great interview there. So don't miss that. And we're going to see you guys on future episodes of Mega Talks. And remember, follow the podcast on our social media Mega Talks on Facebook, Mega underscore Talks on Twitter, and on Instagram is one word, Mega Talks. And in the future, I'll be talking with you.